Okay, whilst, uh, whilst we're getting set up here, um, you've heard from uh, Tom and from Usman. Um, what I'd like to do to start us off is to get the remaining five panelists to do a quick introduction so you know a little bit about where they're coming from. So I'll start at this end and we'll go along. So Kenji. Uh, I'm so. Kenji Takeda from Microsoft Research. Um, I lead our global cloud computing for research program, um, but a great advocate for RSEs uh, and open data as well and enjoy the IoT kit. Hi, I'm Caroline Jay from the University of Manchester. So I'm currently an investigator on the CityVerve project, which is the UK's largest Internet of Things demonstrator, whatever one of those is. And uh, I, I work a lot with both open and closed health data, and, and we make health data open by calling it something else. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Rosie Higman. I'm from the University of Cambridge. So I work in the Central Research Data Management team, and my job is to help researchers better manage their data, and part of that is making it more open. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Durer from the Oxford e Research Centre. Um, yes. <laughs> um, one of the projects I'm representing here um, today is um, the Petrus EPSRC Internet of Things Research Hub, which somehow relates to, to what Caroline said somehow. Um, but I am um, previously in the Internet of Things world, I once ran a uh, a DTI, remember that? The Centre for Pervasive Computing in the Environment. Um, I've also been involved with um, ESRC very much in the um, sort of social media data, new and emerging forms of data, real time analytics area. Though in Oxford, I'm mainly known as a professor of unscientific computing because I do digital humanities and digital social science. Um, I'm Andrew Hufton. I'm the managing editor of Scientific Data, which is a journal from Nature Research. Um, I think <laughs> mostly I write emails, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I think my goal is to try to make uh, publications about data a first class scientific product. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so, this is a panel on. Oh, I, oh do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming that people now know um, about what, what Tom and Usman have done from their, from their wonderful keynotes. So this is a panel on IoT and open data and the implications for research. Um, this is quite interesting because uh, I think in some ways when I was first asked to chair this panel, I wasn't quite sure whether the two subjects would come together, but having heard the keynotes, I'm now even more convinced that not only can they come together, but that they should come together. So what I've asked the uh, panelists to do is consider a few questions, but I also want to make sure that um, the audience make this a very participatory part panel. So I've also asked the panelists to consider questions they might have of you, of the audience as well, and I'm hoping that they ask them. Uh, to kind of kick things off though, uh, I, I wanted to kind of ask all of the panelists um, what what do you, you know, with the advances in Internet of Things, um, in open data, how do you think research is changing? So how do you think um, what, we, what we've been doing and what most of the people in this room are doing is changing? So um, take it away. Who'd like to answer first? <laughs> no. no. So I, I run a multidisciplinary centre and one of the, the privileges of that is to see the different cultures as, as research changes across different disciplines, it's a very different picture across the landscape. But I can see lots of sort of shifts in, in scholarship and really relating to our first keynote, in many ways this isn't about the technology, this is absolutely about the people. So if I wanted to identify one thing, it isn't the Internet of Things, it's the empowered people. I think you had a great line about empowerment. Um, and so where we see changes is, for example, where people are far more engaged in the digital world thanks to the web and devices, so citizen science for example, would be a, a shift in, in scholarship. It's easy to forget these things if you just focus on the individual technologies. Um, what we see in social media is people empowered to create entirely new <coughs> social processes, which uh, you know, was, was, was hard in the past. This, this is something which is a subject of study in social science. It's also a means of doing research. And I think many of the things we've done in social media analytics, the new methodologies there around social media and the web, may be our best rehearsal for what happens in the Internet of Things. I mean, it's an open question as to whether it's a very good rehearsal, but I think it's the best thing we have when it comes to, for example, real-time analytics, but being really um, society-centric. Yeah. 
Rosie, from, from your perspective, looking at it from almost the, the other side, from the library side, have you seen any changes happening? Um, yeah, I think I'd actually echo what David just said in that it varies hugely across disciplines. So we can come here today and it seems like most people are sharing their data, it's all going up on GitHub, your source is open. And at the same time I can go into a humanities department and be shouted out of the room for suggesting that they might share a tiny proportion of what they do. Um, and I think this is actually a, a challenge for institutions and I think it's where people uh, who are interested in software can really lead the way in that you can show us how it's done. In my role, I have to support every single discipline, and I'm not going to be able to do that much for you guys because you're ten times ahead of everyone else. But if you can show us how it's done and you can test lots of things, show us what doesn't work and show us what does work, then I think actually you're leading the way for other disciplines to be able to be more open, to be more um, systematic, to code more as part of their research and sort of make that shift over time. How about, um, Andrew, from the publisher's point of view, what's, what's changing? I, I don't like to make broad prognostications about anything, um, but I, I will say, and, and David mentioned this as well, is, is um, we are seeing more and more citizen science making it, its way into top level research. And I have to say that um, it's still a bit of a trickle, um, and that's not entirely new. You know, bird watching, for example, has had a citizen component to it for hundreds of years um, and other fields as well, but some of this stuff is becoming incredibly um, detailed and complex and there's almost a science well there is a science of how to design a good citizen science project with people who are specializing in this and researching it and talking about it and so, so that's exciting to see and I think that's really transformative and that has to do with everyone carrying around sensors mm -hmm. where they go and a lot of that where that's starting to happen is with health right so we're just starting to see these first big research kit data sets coming out and that's going to really challenge I think the old model of medical um, data sharing um, in ways that I think it's going to take a couple decades to work through because historically people don't, most laws don't allow you to own your health data. You, maybe you own it, but there's, it's uh, paternalistically <coughs> protective. So it's, it's, I think it's changing a lot of thinking and a lot of... Uh, can, can I do a quick show of hands? Uh, are the people in the audience, who would be interested at getting a, an, a, an individual's data, so, so the sort of data that we generate ourselves in our everyday lives for their research. Who would be interested in, in using that for their research? Okay, so there's quite, quite a few people there. Um, so is that changing as well? Do people think that uh, this data is becoming more available, or is it becoming harder to get at, um, uh, paradoxically, because uh, because basically people are becoming more aware of perhaps the security implications around uh, their data. Sorry, we've only got one, one microphone here. I think, it, I think people are generally quite conscious that opening up your data can be useful, but I think also on the other side, from a legal and policy side, if you basically look at the implications of GPDR, I mean, it's human, I mean, it could just wipe wipe this out completely. So I think it's, it's very important to realize that there are some really big policy issues going through, particularly at the you know, European level, and the UK says it will implement GPDR anyway. But and how this then rolls through... GPDR is? Who doesn't know what GPDR is? So the new data regulation coming in uh, in 2018 uh, that will be very specific around data protection. Um, uh, and it's, it's gonna, it's, there's going to be a... 4% of global revenue fine for any organization that breaches that. So for Microsoft, that's $4 billion per breach, for instance, or Google, okay? Um, and so, so I think we might see quite a clamping down on this, and so I think we need to be very cognizant of that in you know, open data and open research, that there's a very specific um, a sort of position on that, um, because we obviously need to protect people's privacy uh, on one side, but then the benefits to society are huge on the other side. Caroline, what's your perspective as someone trying to get hold of that data? So I think it's quite interesting, and I think one of the, the things that is really important in research is to be very upfront with people about what you're doing with their data. So what we tend to find, there, there are lots of people who are very reluctant to share health data, for example, um, which is understandable. But actually, um, if you explain to people what you're doing and give them the option of not being included in that, um, people are much more likely to be positive about it. 
Um, and certainly people are very interested in other people's data and, and willing to share it themselves. So one of the projects I've been working on recently, which is a citizen science project, is called um, Britain Breathing. And it's where people share their hay fever and asthma symptoms. And one of the things that people really wanted to know about was other people's symptoms. So we thought, we originally thought this was going to be, we wanted the data for immunology research, we thought it was going to be a quantified self app, and in fact, it's turned into an app which quantifies you know, the populations or, or samples uh, symptoms so other people can understand it. And people are very happy to share that kind of data because they can see the obvious benefit. So I think that's the key in this situation. That, that seems to touch on some of the things that uh, both Usma and Tom brought up in their talks. I'm going to throw it open to the, the audience. Um, do we have quest a question for our panel at this point? Yeah, James. Simon is kindly agreeing to, to <laughs> ferry the microphone again. Awesome. <coughs> yeah, quantified self. So uh, we're in a room designed for um, people to copy down lecture notes. Um, it's quite a modern room, but it's still designed for people to copy down lecture notes. How will the uh, data and IoT worlds transform the physical structures of the university as a place to do research and the way we, the way we make our departments and that kind of thing, um, you know, both institutionally and in terms of physical infrastructure? Any questions? Did everyone hear that? Yeah. I don't know. Am I still? Oh, oh you're I still have right. <laughs> You can show me roles. <laughs> so, um, uh, ranting and or suggesting improvements to universities uh, has been one of my things in the past. <laughs> and uh, and I, I was uh, always very frustrated by the fact that uh, you had to go to lectures. So I, I, I did uh, a degree in physics. Um, a long time ago and there are answers and if you know them you know them and if you can find the answer you know how to find the answer and you don't have to go to a lecture to do it and you don't necessarily have to listen to the same lecture from the same lecturer who sets your exam to do it. That's, to me that's the dream. So I learned how to do linear algebra which let me do all of this computer vision stuff from a lecturer at the MIT and I never had to go there but I failed my exam in it. And this is a problem we've got, is that the university business model is set up to sell you a qualification. And the way that it checks that you are allowed to have the qualification is whether you turn up to lectures. And I'm pretty sure that at Leeds University now, they check whether you go somewhere. And what they should really do is turn their phones off. Um, so I, I think that uh, internet learning has been a complete failure, uh, except for, oh my goodness, except for one which has worked really well, which is Disney, because everyone in the whole world, young people, can speak English fantastically well, despite never having had very good English lessons. They all learn it by watching Nickelodeon. So I think that um, Internet of Things, is it going to change the way universities work? My opinion is probably not. My dream is that, again, the hate's coming, but I think we should separate teaching and research. I think that the research of this university should be down there in Leeds and I think the teaching can be here and at the minute we just do them in the same place for no reason and I, I, I don't get it at all. I still don't get it. Want to respond? Again, I think splitting it into teaching and, and, and research, I mean, we, we have a lot of conversations around what we call connected campus, so how can technology do interesting things on the campus, but it has to be led by the pedagogy, right? I mean, that's, you know, this is this is a Victorian layout. Actually, this is like the Royal Society, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Very you much could so. You dissect a piece exactly. of software. Yeah, then exactly. <laughs> so, 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 you know, and my colleague Dave, we've digitized, we've digitized, we've, we've very quickly digitizing Victorian processes. And we're quite good at that. Um, well, we actually have to rethink it from a, a pedagogy perspective. So on, on the teaching side, I think, you know, it has to be, you know, the people, as we saw in, in, in the school, in Trumpington, you know, how do you really engage students? On the research side, I think it's, it's, it's interesting with IoT. I mean, um, I'm a, from Southampton. Uh, Jeremy Frey had this idea, you know, connected devices in the chemistry lab. So every device was blogging. So you knew what the temperature of the lab was. So when you were trying to do your reproducible research, you had that and you could refer back to date. So I think there are lots of things that will happen back in the old e-science uh, day. Smart T, you remember that one? Um, so I think there is a lot of ideas from there that are now possible. 
okay, because we've got much better connectivity and cloud and those types of things. So, so I think the ideas have often been there, and it's just a matter of the, the timing. But I think in the research space, particularly in labs, in sort of wet labs and those things, there's a huge amount of, of, of benefit we can have. So I know there's quite a few people in the audience who uh, are very engaged in teaching. How do, how do you think? Is there anyone who's got an opinion on how how uh, IoT open data might change the university structures around teaching in your organizations? Yes. Uh, down there, Simon? Or? Um, I think we already um, doing something about it in terms of um, flipped classroom. Uh, I don't know whether you know what I'm talking about. Actually, giving the students data, appointing them to the source of data to prepare for the discussion during the lecture rather than imparting that particular knowledge. So um, I think the Internet of Things in that context is already have a, um, already has an impact in the classroom. This is probably slightly predictable coming from me, but I think mostly it'll be used in teaching and learning for evil. Um, I go to a lot of ed tech conferences, and um, it's mostly about monitoring and surveillance and all of that other stuff that they like to use data for in education, and letting people like Pearson take over the world. So I think that stuff is will get buy-in from administration much much quicker than anything innovative that actually helps learning. Yeah, do so, so I think there's the balance there. So it's interesting, GISC have a learning analytics, they're trying to launch a national learning analytics project, which is quite interesting. But um, yeah. you know, we did a project at University of Tacoma where we reduced the dropout rate in the high school by using those same systems. So I think you can use them for good, but you have to be mindful of what else they can be used for. So I think it's, like you say, technology can be used in different ways. Hi, so at Southampton we've had some successes with this. Uh, we've used open data to get more value out of resources. So our computer rooms, which we have over a thousand workstations, and the students can go online and find a computer room that isn't busy. And we got a brilliant complaint that there was one computer room that was always guaranteed to be really quiet, <laughs> and now it's as busy as everywhere else. So in other words, we've just made that thing pay for itself where it wasn't previously. But um, the other way around, the things, I'm not sure if it's quite an Internet of Things, but um, one experiment some of our colleagues did was built a online physical experiment. So the students connected to a very expensive motor, gave it some instructions, some sanity checks made sure they didn't break it, and it ran the, their experiment, recorded video of that <coughs> experiment, recorded the outputs of their experiment, and gave them a video and a the data set back that they created. And it struck me that that could be a really good thing for sort of bulk learning, distance learning. I spoke to some scientists and they said it's a terrible idea because you don't get the experience of being in a lab. And the entire point of being at university is you get the training for being in a lab. But it's much cheaper. Um, got James there. That reminds me of um, something uh, when I went to one of the very large geosciences um, conferences, even in some of the areas where uh, all of the work that's being done is entirely computational. They still wanted people to do a few field visits simply so that they had a sense of how the people whose data they were relying on collected that data so they could understand what mistakes might have happened. Yes, yeah, so you, I think both those things come into to where my hope is, which is that uh, gives, this gives quite a big hope for um, research-based education and what they call the connected curriculum. Um, so giving undergraduates more of a chance to play with real scientific data as it's coming out of the instruments in, in labs. I think that's, that's probably something that um, this gives us a chance to do that we, we otherwise might not. And if you want a kind of businessy reason to do it, then that helps not make a lie, the thing we've always been claiming about how good it is to do your undergraduate degree in a um, top research university, <laughs> which has in the past been a little less than true, um, but we connected curriculum is the hope to make that, that true. Okay. I'm, I'm going to riff on Penny's uh, response and kind of ask the panel, uh, what do you think people's biggest fears of the work that you're doing and, and how do you reassure them? Because for instance, uh, one of the things that was, that was mentioned in the kind of like uh, discussion around um, your, uh, your, your um, 
I'm trying to remember, is it virtual fuse? I'm trying to remember the nature fuse. Yeah. Uh, was what happens when someone kind of hacks into that and kills all the plants in the neighborhood? So, yeah, what, what, what are the fears that you um, have to face um, from the people who are interested or not interested in your work, and how do you reassure them? So, if I start with a sort of, uh, there's a couple of things. One is you have to persuade senior policy people that this is a good thing for you to be doing and that it's worthwhile and that it's better than the paper that gets published in Science or Nature. Um, and I think that's still a case to be made. Um, and the other thing that I think hasn't been communicated very well is around all the ethical issues. Um, ethics panels are still very risk averse. Sometimes with good reason, because sometimes people come in with a shiny new project, and I've had these conversations with researchers where they say, I'm really excited about this thing that I'm doing, and so I want to go and do it, and you kind of have to say, well, okay, stop, wait, can we share this data? Do you know what someone could potentially do in 10 years' time with that data, with more computing power and more open data sets? And so I think actually one of the things that might allay some of these fears is more conversations between computer scientists, social scientists and ethicists and a more interdisciplinary approach which would kind of balance things out a little bit. Uh, I was going to say that I, of course I'm not really working in um, straight research so I find myself in a slightly different predicament but I, I don't ever want to be in the position of having to convince someone that I've got the right idea that they should join in on. What I'm looking to do essentially is to build up enough trust to say that we can figure out what the problem is together and figure out what to do about it. Because actually I have no idea uh, uh, how to deal with it. Um, but more specifically on open data, I wanted to sort of raise a question which, or, or, or a predicament, another kind of predicament that kind of intersects here. And I'm thinking of, um, uh, in a book called To Save Everything, Click Here by Evgeny Morozov. He quotes some research um, that showed that in a city where uh, property prices and crime data were made public, in other words, it was open data, um, what happened was that as a result of crime being reported in certain locations, property prices went down. Um, and as a result of that, people stopped reporting crime. Um, uh, and so it has this kind of interesting repercussions, I think, outside of the idea of you know, wanting to do research on data and sort of keeping it somewhat neutrally bounded. Um, when it kind of intersects with the sort of practicalities of people's fears or concerns or even just their kind of understanding of the way these things interact. So it sort of, it has totally unpredictable uh, consequences. Okay. I'd just like to sort of drill down on those two comments and bring us towards software. <laughs> um, the, I think the ethics point's r really good. A few years ago, there was a, a government housing on the select committee inquiry with the title of um, social media data and real-time analytics. And it was looking at the great opportunities afforded by social media analytics. The report that came out from that committee was called Responsible Use of Data because they universally found in all the oral and written evidence that people are hugely concerned about the personal data. So in the answer to the question, what's the biggest worry? That seems to be it. Now, the interesting thing going on on the ethics side um, is this movement towards responsible innovation. So this idea that we think about not just the ethical process, but the, the purpose of, of our work and the product of our work and the ethical considerations there. In fact, if you're applying for EPSRC funding now, you have to write a paragraph about this. The reviewers don't know what the right answer is. You have to write a paragraph <laughs> about it. Um, and I think that's really interesting in the context of software and in the context of Internet of Things. Because one of the characteristics of, of Internet of Things, this goes back to the empowerment point, is we, we can come up with all sorts of manufacturers come up with all sorts of products with specific intentions as to how they were used, but people will do other stuff. It's the unanticipated and it's the creative and subversive assembly of things, which is the, the empowerment we get from Internet of Things. Um, how you do responsible innovation when you don't know what people are going to do with it is pretty tricky. But the ambition might be, and I've seen projects try to do this, to think about the responsible innovation from day one, you don't just bring in the ethics in at the end, 
uh, and to make the, the entire software engineering process influenced by the responsible innovation, which I think is, a, is, is good, but we have these challenges. I'll be quick. So, what's the number one bit of negative feedback that I get from users? The number one piece is, why does this cost so much? That's the feedback I get for software that I sell for £2.49. <laughs> right? So, a single click on an ad in that same app earns me £2. It can earn me up to £5 if I sell the data to make the ad more relevant to the user. So the biggest problem that I have with ethical computing and all these type of things is I would love to be able to pay my rent by doing everything properly and fantastically and wonderfully and, and, and smile about everything. I can't do that. People will not pay £2.49 to not have their data sold. And until we start the ethical conversation, I know where I want to be. I want to be in a place where I don't ever sell any data. I don't sell any data, by the way. They get the £2 ad. But it, it, it is a temptation, and you talk to any great game developer, you talk to any great software developer out there, the, the software that people are choosing to use, the services that people are choosing to use, are the ones where they don't pay, and they get, then they are paying with their data. That's the sad fact of it. What are the thoughts from the audience on that? Um, <coughs> and then, yes. So that, that point is, is one that I've heard quite a few times, that you know, uh, what we're willing to pay for indicates what, what, where our true priorities are and, and that we don't actually value our data or we don't actually value environmentalism because you know, we're not willing to pay the premium for these things. And I've always wondered, could it be that we actually overvalue money rather than undervaluing <laughs> all of the other things? <laughs> Good point. Um, let's take it over to Dan first, unless you have a direct response. So I was just, what, what my feeling about what was just said was, we, those of us that work in universities need to remember our privilege of being allowed to work on these things without having to, you know, find ways to get paid that involve uh, other ways. And let's not work for university and then do the bad stuff, which I think most of you, you would end up doing. Okay. So, uh, yeah, sorry. So I was going to um, bring up something uh, related to the, the earlier discussion, but maybe a little bit different than the ethical piece, which was uh, this uh, article or commentary that was in Nature maybe three or four weeks ago uh, from the person that had, if I'm, I'm going to interpret this and I could be slightly off, a uh, person had published a paper based on data they had collected over a long time, and as a consequence, as a requirement for publishing the paper, they had to publish the data. And then other people started using that data and publishing other papers. Yeah. Uh, and so the person that sent in the, the original paper was complaining that he felt like he'd spent a huge amount of time collecting the data and wanted actually more opportunity to take, to, to do research on it before it became public but because he was publishing this first piece, he had, to, he had to make it public. And so I guess I'm just curious in general what, um, if there's some, some model that's in between open data and closed data that, um, that makes sense in cases like this. So let me see if I can give a little bit of context on that, that yeah. paper that was in Nature as well, because, and I don't know if I'm remembering it 100% either, so you know, if I say something that seems a bit off, <coughs> you know, don't tweet it immediately. But if I recall correctly, this was a, a clinical trial. Uh, it was a clinical trial data set, um, and it was a comment in Nature where um, some of these authors um, Clinical trials are not, the data is not usually released uh, publicly. And I continue to be shocked by this, that you can publish a clinical trial and not put the data out there for other people to, to sort of challenge your findings. Um, and there's good reasons for this, and privacy protection is one of them. Um, but I would also go a little bit of a step further to, to say that the medical field in general, and no insults to anyone's here, has a culture that is um, very um, opposed to direct criticism. Um, so, it, especially when it comes down to data, people are very, very afraid of people reinterpreting their data. And so this case, the, the original trial was published, and then six months later they ran, I think, a challenge with the land set, and then they came out of it and said, well, that's great, but we could have sat on the data for another five years and continued to spin out papers. Now, again, 
not being disrespectful to those authors because they were doing more than what's common. Most other fields would call that unethical science. Right? Um, to, to, okay, so putting it up on, you know, they've made a challenge, they did great things, but to actually publish it and say no one else can have it, I'm going to sit on it for the next five years, very few fields would allow that. You know, nature journals have agreed for the last 30 years that if you publish a paper, you have to at least give your data to people upon request. So, I, so medical trial data sharing is so complicated at the moment, and it's really outside of most of the open data conversation. And so we shouldn't, I think this is an, an amazingly interesting case, um, but a little bit separate than the vast majority. Clinical trial data, we can almost talk about all day. So again, if anyone is, if I misunderstand remembering the case, and if this is really not about the specific case, but. I think, in general, you have to think about who actually paid for that research to be done, because I'm certain that research is funded by a research council which is paid for by taxpayers' money. And so when you say, oh, that's my data, well, it's data that you collected, but, you know, who paid your salary during the time you were collecting it, and, you know, those kind of other sort of also ethical issues about how we, how we open data for scientific use. So, so just really quickly, uh, just as a, a partial response to that, I think the, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think the question is, how do we give people that are collecting data uh, enough of an incentive that they actually will do it? Because I think that was really well, the issue. I think we've already solved that problem because they had to open the data mm -hmm. to publish in Nature. Well, they did, so they wasn't none of this. They didn't have to. They, never, they didn't publish. So this was just there was a commentary published in Nature. So they yeah. were never. They were not required to publish the data with their first publication. I don't remember what journal it is. Doesn't matter. Um, um, they then, working with the Lancet, did a, a six months later or something. They did a challenge where certain people were allowed to see the data as part of a competition. But they did not release the data with their original paper. And releasing the data with your original paper is not common for clinical trials. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like say that we'll, on this point we'll take from uh, you, Chris, and then we've got two other hands up there that we'll take. But I think uh, after that we'll kind of close this one off because I think this is, this is an area around credit and mechanisms that we could talk for, for an entire thing. So yeah. Uh, Chris, and then you, and then you. Okay, so. be quick then. Um, first of all, obviously, all clinical trials shouldn't be considered valid if they don't publish before they do the trial, so that all the ones that they don't finish count. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but um, the real problem here, I'm what's called a full stack lab developer. I can do a fairly crappy web design, but I can build everything from setting up the web server to uh, designing the website and doing a bit of social media. But that's not usual, and in most places you do not have need to have someone who has all of the skills at an amateur level that I do at every level to do something and however in science you do you have to be a data collector you have to design protocols you have to execute them you have to analyze them you have to write them up and that's bloody stupid and we need to get over that and we need to make someone able to publish their data and then if the person's created a trial, that trial is done. They then get academic credit for that, they get citations, and their career is benefited. They don't have to keep it in a drawer. Um, when we were working on ePrints, we had to put a thing in that wasn't an embargo to a certain date because of papers, but it was also being used on some of the stuff from chemistry for people who had done us in crystallography and one day might want to do a paper on it, so they don't want to publish the data yet in case they ever want to run it might get a paper out of it later, so we came up with a compromise that they could put a two-year limit on it and it would become public if they forgot. Okay. But, yeah. yeah. That's a very good point. So, again, the whole, the whole Simon realising that uh, the que uh, questions spread across the room. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got um, so, so, so I agree with uh, the fact you should get credit for, for, for data, um, but I, if I'm remembering correctly, um, at the beginning of that uh, genome sequencing, uh, there was a, a sort of an unusual deal done where you, you, people were publishing the data very hot off the press, and they were, the, 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 the data paper basically put a marker down to say, we, you know, we want to look at X and Y, and then there was a sort of gentleman's agreement that other people would kind of look at anything else but would leave you know, the, 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 the stuff that the marker was down for for the original authors. So, so I think there's something that could be done sort of in between. Okay. Uh, last response on this? Can I uh, oh, yeah, maybe just uh, introduce one, one concept? I have no idea whether this would apply in this case, but what we do for time series data 
Um, the question was, is there something between open and closed? And one of the, the kind of strategies we use is that um, basically you get access to, for, for a certain set of data in between open and closed, you get access to data at a resolution that you contribute to. So if you want to get access at high resolution, you need to contribute high resolution data of, of some sort. And if you uh, are okay with just low resolution data, then you can contribute only low resolution data. The idea is basically to incentivize higher resolution. And that may or may not work for other cases, but certainly for time series data, it, it, it works quite well. Okay. Um, okay, S moving slightly off, uh, based on what one of the panelists said on uh, clinical trials not always wanting to open up, it's, it's the openness of data and misuse of data. Uh, I mean, how do you persuade people to open up the data and deal with it? In that, I mean, the, the obvious example is some in the medical field, but from the ones I've seen more recently, of just simple political ones where the data needs things applied to it before it's valid, and you need to weight it depending on what you want to do with that data. And otherwise, it's going to be pub someone. Someone will be publishing it with well, not publishing really, but you know, media post truth politics sort of weird stuff of going. Well, it shows this, 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 and this. It's like, well, you haven't waited for it and sorted this out and filtered the data essentially. Yeah, do you want to go first? Well, well, sorry, sorry, we've talked about that yeah. a lot. So I'm going to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, in short, people are going to do that whatever you do. If you report on your data in a scientific paper and the Daily Mail wants to interpret it in one way because they have a particular agenda, they will do that whatever. At least if your data is out there, we have a chance, and particularly if scientists are willing to engage in this debate, we actually have a chance to change the narrative and to make sure that it's based on the data that exists. And I think this is also another good argument for good documentation because it's much, much harder for people to do that if you've put the very clear documentation out there which says this is what this data is and this is the context that it should be seen in. I was going to reinforce that point. The data by itself is ultimately useless. You have to have the context, the metadata. When I used to work with Formula 1 teams, I'd send two hard drives, one with the raw data on it, and then I'd send a completely separate package with metadata on it. <laughs> you know, all encrypted anyway, but because I thought you needed both to reconcile, right? So I think the context, and that's why the scientific data journal is kind of critical step in that direction. Um, but like you say, people will always use the data in different ways, and I think that's in the medical domain uh, where it gets gets quite tricky. I mean, if you're interested in the clinical trial stuff, have a look at vivoli.org, which is a new nonprofit coming out of Harvard and Brigham Women, so it's trying to build a platform for sharing clinical trial data in a very secure private way as well, so that, that whole area. But I think yeah, the context and the metadata, and I think that's where this community and publishing methods and reproducible research more than the PDF um, is really required um, in order to make this data you know, truly usable. Okay. Karen, do you want to say anything? I think, um, actually, so I think Kendra's made a really, really important point there um, in terms of the uh, understanding the context. So there is still a belief, I believe, in many aspects of computer science research so when we're looking at things like uh, smart building control and, and things like this, that actually if you have enough data, you just need the data, all you need is the data and the data will tell you what to do. And of course this is just not true. And so I think understanding, in terms of research challenges, understanding things in context where it's actually very difficult to collect that context because it's in, in a control trial you have it, in the field you don't. Um, is, is a massive, it's going to be a massive issue. Um, got a response, last response here from James. So we've said for ages, haven't we, that in order to do reproducible research you need to share the two tuple of the data and the software that you have for the analysis. Perhaps what we're learning here is we need to share the three tuple of the software, the data, and how it was paid for, and the, ins the interest declaration of the person doing the analysis. Uh, in order to actually be able to do the reproducibility audit on the data. Got a comment over there? Oh, hi there. Uh, one of the things that has not really been popping up too much is the uh, question of IP rights. So, for example, being in engineering, um, I can tell you for a fact that Rolls-Royce and Shell will not let the data be public. Right, so the question is, and this is a, a question for everybody here that happens to have EPSO-related funding, is if your funding stipulates in no uncertain terms that part of it is to be uh, open data and open software, etc., um, how do you ratify that with companies like 
Rolls Royce and Shell that say, oh, actually, we let you have anonymized data that is, let's say, our own <coughs> units, but any of this metadata, no chance, which do totally defeat the point of reproducibility. I can't give anybody else reproducible um, metrics with respect to our data. I was also wondering if Rosie wanted to, do you want, do you want to take a professional viewpoint? Or? Yeah, I'll do the boring institutional bit. Um, this is a really big problem. We've had this too. Rolls-Royce in particular do not like sharing, um, which isn't a massive surprise. So there's kind of two things. One is that the anonymous data might be a step up from nothing at all. And at the moment, we can you know, take that. The other thing is a colleague, and I won't name the institution, another institution did an analysis on all their EPSERC-funded papers found uh, just over a quarter of them actually had data availability statements and less than a quarter of the, about a fifth of those had data availability statements that actually led to data that was still live. So I am completely overwhelmed and very happy that you really want to share your data. If we could get the other three quarters of the EPSERC funded people who probably don't have Rolls-Royce joint funding to actually share their data, then I think that would be a bigger progress. I think it is a real problem. EPSEC need to work this out with Rolls-Royce. But I also think that the other three quarters of the people who aren't doing their bit at the moment is a bigger problem. There's quite a lot of companies. It's a big problem with anything that's commercial. So I can rack off loads of company names. I don't think it's necessarily a EPSEC to uh, a particular company type thing. I think it's more of a a wider policy, uh, even maybe governmental, I don't know, but you know, so Texas Instruments, ST Microelectronics, NXP, Philips, you, know, you can rack thousands of these companies off. Uh, a uh, UK research um, council to a single company dialogue is not what we need here. It's, a, it's probably a, a new paradigm, really. So so I'm going to uh, I'm going to kind of like have uh, yeah, yeah. yeah Kenji have the last last mm -hmm. words but I think one thing to note is that all of the research councils are in dialogue with industry <coughs> to understand so it's not as if they're completely separate in many cases um, in fact Kenji and I sit on one committee where uh, there are a number of industrialists feeding into the strategy so so I guess the question here is as you're right it is the larger picture that that needs to be changed but there are a number of connections that are there to try and um, move on the change. So I, I just yeah. want to pick on that very specific example. So I was in aerospace engineering at Southampton, so, so I did work with Rolls-Royce. Uh, we sat with the Airbus Noise Technology Centre. I worked with about five different Formula One teams, um, doing PhD research, publishing in the open literature. And basically, when you do that type of research, up front, you have to, with those PhD students, say, we're going to do a track down here where we might develop some new methods and some new science. We're going to use some canonical examples, which are actually more useful anyway than a specific example. Or we did an uh, interesting example of the European project with Airbus, where we were doing simulations and wind tunnel experiments on an A320 landing gear with all the exact CAD models for that. But we worked with Airbus to build a generic landing gear model. I think Boeing may have been involved as well to create benchmark data sets for people to then test their advanced methods. So, so I think you have to think about that boundary and actually construct the research program. And we did this with Rolls-Royce, where we published turbofan noise data, but it was a canonical Rolls-Royce jet engine geometry, which was realistic, that they were happy to publish. Whilst on the inside, we were also feeding in data on some of the A380, A350 engine designs. So, so I think you, you have to be mindful, but you can construct the sort of two-track way of doing it, because canonical examples are actually more useful in research anyway than a very specific product one. So, but yeah, it's, it's a huge issue, and I was on the EPSERT Research Data Management working group that came up with the, 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 the um, policy. Uh, and one of the industrialists said, so what that means is you're going to take all the UK generated IP and give it to China and India <coughs> late. And so it, it, you have to be very careful, but there are ways of doing it. And I think it's a two-way conversation. Okay, we are nearly out of time. So just before we wrap up, I had one last question that um, I asked all of the panelists to, to kind of prepare a one sentence <laughs> answer to. So we, start with, we can start <laughs> at that end. <laughs> so the, qu the question was, um, can you finish the following <laughs> sentence? Uh, and that sentence is, the biggest advances in IoT and open data will happen because... Um, 
<laughs> you're that was very clever. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You see how, the, how I was going to start Kenji and then he quickly shuffled yes. the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I, I answered the previous question. I forgot the move ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you know, frankly, I think that um, we are on the cusp of a step change over the next 20 years about the way we live. Uh, in relation to each other as well as our cities. I mean, there is, there is the environmental issue to discuss. There's the fact that our financial institutions are, are, um, are looking a little bit shaky. And there's the fact that our political and democratic institutions are looking shakier than ever before. So I think all of that is, um, is going to have a tremendous impact. So, uh, advance through things breaking. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the advance is going to come through not having to ask permission to do stuff. With open data, you, you just get the data and do what you want with it. With open IoT, you build your thing and you just turn it on. Okay. Andrew? I, I don't know anything about IoT, I have to admit, but, but I, the thing that's changing open data the fastest at the moment is, is funders, in our view. It, it, um, as unexciting as that is, funders are really jumping on that bandwagon and it's having a huge impact on what we do as publishers and what scientists do and scientists are going to have to deal with their open data office in many cases instead of their IP office soon at universities around the planet. Dave? I think the biggest thing is that some rethinking will occur and that's thanks to humans being empowered and creative. Your, your question earlier, Neil, about spectrums like this and how will it change? Well, the reason they're like this is due to some strengths of the old way of doing things. If you ask why we're here in the first place, what was the purpose of learning? We didn't discuss practice-based learning, all that stuff. It's um, I, We tend to look at things these days with glasses, and sometimes we have to take them off. Maybe go back in time even and look back into the future, but really rethinking creativity. Rosie? Um, so I think the biggest change will happen when um, we educate people at an undergraduate level in programming sufficiently well that instead of there being, I'm going to guesstimate 50 people in the room, we would need five rooms of this size and then actually everything that we're doing to release open data would be much more powerful. Caroline. I suspect I'm going to build on Dave's point here actually. So um, at the moment, um, these advances are primarily technology driven, technology push. And actually I think the biggest advances are going to occur when it starts to be human pull. So we think about what we really want from this technology and use that to drive the way that we design it. Finally, Kenji. I think I, think I just want to follow on. She stole my point. Um, <laughs> Should have gone first. It's actually, <laughs> and it's actually also going beyond that. So thinking about how we can empower people, but also not thinking about the implementation. Because the implementation is often easy once you've actually thought through the problem and the technology probably is already available. Whereas if you start with the technology, you, you, you're kind of artificially constraining yourself. I think. So yeah, think, think big and imaginatively. I think the technology then becomes easy. I think that's a great point to end on. Um, thank you so much to our panelists.